trickling in, then um, they can always catch up. But I'm Hope Newport. I'm the Family Services Manager here at the International FOP Association. So thank you to everyone for joining us for our fifth webinar of 2020. Today's topic is nutrition and FOP, as you can see. Um, and I'd like to start by just going over a few um, little aspects of Zoom webinar that some of you may not be familiar with. So most of us have probably joined a Zoom meeting by now, but you'll notice that in a webinar, um, you don't have a camera and you don't have a microphone. So um, everyone is muted just to prevent any background noise. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't interact though. There is a Q&A um, and also a chat feature. So if you have um, anything that you wanted to submit for um, a question for the panelists, for Natalie, you can submit that through the Q&A. Um, and then if there's anything that you wanted to share with the group, you can submit that through the chat. So um, as we're going through the presentation, please feel free to submit those questions. And if it's on topic to what Natalie's speaking to at the moment, she'll answer it or I'll um, make sure she sees it if we're on that topic. And if we don't answer it during the presentation, um, we'll definitely get to that at the end. And um, we've left some time for that as well. So, um, and lastly, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, a recording will be available. So if you're one of those people who likes to jot down um, notes, don't feel like you have to capture everything. You'll go, be able to go back and see Natalie's slides. So um, Natalie Ledesma is um, a registered nutrition with over 20 years of experience as a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, she's a board certified specialist in oncology oncology nutrition um, and is the clinical nutrition specialist at Smith Integrative Oncology in San Francisco. She's the founding dietitian for the nutrition program at the University of California, San Francisco, Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. She serves as a consultant and a speaker for digestive care and is a member of the Lilly Lecture Bureau faculty. Um, she regularly presents to healthcare practitioners on nutritional counseling and oncology care. She is a certified LEAP therapist who helps manage adverse food reactions with an emphasis on food sensitivities. And Natalie provides nutrition counseling and frequently presents nationally on various cancer and integrative health focused nutrition topics. She's taught college courses, cooking classes, and has been um, extensively involved in community outreach involvement. So Natalie took some time to get to know a little bit more about the FOP community. Um, we were able to share some great resources with her, really specific to um, you know, some of the challenges that our individuals with FOP face. So thank you so much, Natalie, for being willing to take the time to dive a little deeper into our specific needs. Um, and I'll let you take it from there. Awesome. Well, happy to be here. Good evening, everyone. I'm just looking, saying now who can share, but I'm gonna just make sure I can switch our screen here. So maybe now it will let me, there we go. Yeah, this is exciting to talk with you all about nutrition and the impact of at least some of the common um, FOP disease progression challenges that many of you or your children face. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get, you know, responses and answers to a lot of those questions that you may have um, this evening. So I'm going to dive in and first just kind of have a little bit of Wait, why are we really wanting to learn and gain and know more uh, in terms of having an improved diet, improved nutrition? And um, just, of course, from a back set, we know we want to have a healthy diet for better energy. Um, if we eat well, we also are then going to desire more nourishing foods. Um, so if we eat a lot of vegetables, we're going to want more vegetables. If you eat a lot of sugar, we're going to want more sugar. Um, it also, you know, typically has us have a lesser desire for foods that are less nourishing. Um, we tend to see improved lab values, more stable glucose control, uh, increased muscle mass, strength, flexibility, heightened metabolism, enhanced immune function, which we're definitely needing uh, these days, getting into the the flu season and clearly we're in a pandemic. Um, so they definitely wanna make sure we're having a strong immune system. And generally just helping, you know, having diet be leading us to improved health and just a general sense of our well-being in terms of quality of life. So I was asked to also just make sure to present some basic information. And so I thought the dietary guidelines, um, which have been for 2015, 2020, 
thought I would at least share those. They're very basic, but the idea being that one, we follow a healthy eating pattern across the lifespan. And so that's going to be continually consuming adequate and appropriate number of calories, depending on kind of where we are within our lifespan, um, focusing on variety, on nutrient density, and proper portion limiting our calories from added sugars and saturated fats and also making sure we're being cautious in terms of our sodium intake, um, working instead to shift to healthier food and beverage choices, particularly in terms of beverage, things that have you know, no added sugars or no added sugar substitute types of ideas. Um, and then also just working to kind of support healthy eating patterns for all. Um, we definitely know that you know, how if a parent eats one way, that certainly helps um, children to learn to kind of eat in a similar fashion um, versus if, you know, everyone around you eats, um, you know, McDonald's and, you know, KFC and Coca-Cola, then it's really difficult to eat entirely differently than that. So um, we definitely want to make sure we're supporting ourselves, supporting our families, but even just our whole, our whole community as a whole. This is a kind of a healthy eating plate. This one's from Harvard Medical School, and you may have seen some certain types of renditions of this plate, but this is something I think to keep in mind and perhaps even share with some of the children, depending on their age. Um, sometimes we really want to try to strive to have half of our plate filled with vegetables and fruits. Now, it doesn't have to be in this exact little bento box, but we definitely like the idea of having, you know, 50% of the plate being filled with vegetables and fruits to help provide dietary fiber, vitamins, minerals, and also various types of protective phytochemicals. Um, then of course, we would want to incorporate a good 25% of the plate being filled with some sort of healthy uh, lean protein and or plant protein, um, limiting you know, the red meats and cheese and some of the other um, dairy and bacon and you know, cold cuts, processed meats, things like that. Um, and then for our carbohydrates, um, either this says whole grains. I think it also could be healthy starchy vegetables like sweet potatoes and butternut squash and acorn squash and things like that, but also brown rice and oatmeal and a corn tortilla versus a white flour tortilla and a whole grain bread versus a white bread uh, and so forth. Um, we want to make sure we're having plenty of water and non-caffeinated um, beverages just in terms of adequate hydration. We'll talk a little bit more um, about that momentarily. And then we want to just kind of sprinkle healthy fats, um, you know, throughout. And I would say, I would think of healthy fats being, you know, extra virgin olive oil, um, avocados, almonds, um, cold water fish. Uh, I'm not that they're going to sprinkle that throughout, but definitely a healthy source. Nuts and seeds in general are going to be probably our you know, greatest nutrient um, you know, density sort of healthy fats. Um, and then just trying to make sure we're getting a rainbow assortment of colors to help make sure we're getting a variety of different types of phytochemicals. And the, here, this slide helps to illustrate that Phytochemicals really are all about the color. And so it is good to get a variety of different types of colors. Um, and here you can see, you know, the reds, the oranges, the purpley blues, the greens, and even whites. Now this area, I would say some whites, these are the whites that would be okay, but not meaning white bread, white rice, white pasta, cookies, cakes, desserts, those types of white foods we're trying to actually not have, but cauliflower and garlic and mushrooms, those would be white foods that would be, you know, definitely nutritive to incorporate into our diet. But just kind of thinking, do I have a variety of colors? Do I present different colors? Um, to my child to make sure they're getting a variety of different types of phytochemicals and different types of nutrients. This slide um, is based on the book, What Color Is Your Diet? By, written by Dr. David Heber from UCLA. And um, I also like a book called Color Code. If you're ever looking just for a simple book about why are we having these different colors? Um, and it, the color code is the chapters are like red, green, orange. Um, and this slide helps to also illustrate you know, what phytochemicals are in these different colored um, vegetables or fruits. So for example, if we look at red, lycopene is a very common carotenoid 
um, found particularly in tomatoes, but a little bit also in watermelon and guavas and a little bit of pink grapefruit. Um, and then it kind of shows a little bit in terms of function there. So this is a lot of a, of a resource slide, but I just thought it may, you may find it interesting and kind of give you a little bit more motivation and incentive of why we want to eat some of these different colored um, types of vegetables and fruits. So one of the areas also I was asked to discuss is how do we know um, if we are being adequately nourished? Uh, and granted, there's a lot of different types of lab work that can be done. Um, I was just thinking in terms of what could we do, what could you even do as parents or even as possible, um, even just for, for our own bodies, so I thought about a few different areas that are kind of within the nutrition focused physical assessment category and hair would be one of those. And so if you're looking at your hair or your child's hair or your spouse's hair or whomever, you know, think about what is the color in terms of not meaning is it brown, blonde or gray, but does it seem like it's uniformly colored? Does it seem like you're having, um, you know, some that are really colored and also really dull areas that would kind of indicate maybe there is some nutritive um, challenges? Does it seem like your, the hair is kind of distributed um, well in terms of the quantity? Does it seem like it's becoming very thin? Um, no, it seems very luscious and thick. Um, kind of be able to feel through your hair for texture as well as you know are you let you know is your hand kind of ending up with a whole bunch of hair in your in your hand um, when we see hair thinning and or just simply that we're losing hair it can be related to various nutrients um, a few areas that i think of number one would be if our iron status is low that oftentimes can be thinner and hair as well as just simply losing hair similarly if our zinc status is low that can be the case. And we use zinc to generate production of white blood cells. So if we are having immune challenges, um, and if there's been surgeries or if there have been other significant, so, you know, even diarrhea, we do lose a lot of zinc and diarrhea, um, that could possibly, all those different kinds of things could put us at greater risk of being a little bit low in zinc. Um, so that's one that I want to always offer and assess. And those are areas you can do in mainstream blood work. Um, that doesn't have to be done by out-of-network labs. It can be done through any kind of in-network labs of looking at a zinc level, red blood cell. If you're looking at iron, typically we measure ferritin, which is iron stores. And there's also a full iron panel that can be assessed if that's a question. Um, also, if thyroid is awry, if we have a really sluggish or slower moving thyroid, oftentimes too we see hair thinning and hair loss, and that also those also can be assessed um, with mainstream labs like a TSH free T4, free T3, or three that I definitely like to always look at all of them, um, and then also there could be adrenal challenges, uh, and this is it where cortisol values, if cortisol values have gone really high and or they've crashed all the way down low, we may see that there can be changes in hair. So just a few things to um, keep in mind in terms of hair thinning, hair loss. Um, if the hair is particularly dry and just kind of lacking you know, luster, um, dull, you know, kind of very dull, then two areas that I would consider there is one, protein energy malnutrition you know are we getting in enough protein are we getting in enough calories um, if not that definitely can lead to more of a drier uh, dull hair and then also if we are either not eating enough or if we're not absorbing our essential fatty acids um, so in particular here thinking of omega-3 fatty acids like cold water fish, like salmon, sardines, trout, black cod, but also chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts um, are all really good sources. And then our omega-6 sources would be other types of nuts and seeds. You'll get a little bit also in terms of some animal protein, you know, there. So those are a couple areas to keep in mind. Um, my guess, a little less so in terms of with children, but I felt remiss if I didn't include it. Um, if one is experienced more of a male pattern baldness where you feel like it's kind of a receding um, hairline, that oftentimes can be related to low testosterone levels. And so that's another area that could be assessed to see if it's an all a concern. Um, another area that you can kind of keep in mind would be fingernails. 
Um, and so there, I'm just going to kind of move this Q&A here. Um, if our fingernails are soft and they're cupping, where they kind of have like a little bit of a scoop, um, those definitely could kind of indicate to me, are we lacking protein and or are we lacking iron? Um, and that's something very easy to be able to look even at your own, obviously look at your children. Um, frequently when I'm in the office, which is not very frequently these days because we're doing everything remotely, um, but I like to look at people's hair and I like to look at their nails and I like to look at their tongue and their skin to help me learn more about how I can possibly help one. Um, if you find that you're seeing vertical ridges from the nail bed to the um, tip of the nail that kind of and they're kind of like you can feel it and or you can simply see those ridges that would also indicate possibly low iron status if you see little spots on the nails just almost looks like as if somebody banged their nail really hard or you know closing door but those spots would suggest low zinc levels um, and then we oftentimes too can see something where there's this white band which just kind of covers um, you know the nail from you know but kind of maybe not the distal edge of it and that I don't know that we necessarily would see so much within the FOP community but it can be if there's liver damage and there's cirrhosis and or um, if you have really low albumin levels. And that I figured is a possibility with this population because if protein status is challenged, we're not getting enough protein, then we will see albumin levels you know, be able to drop. So these are things that aren't going to happen in a day, but if they have con continually been an issue, then we'll be able to see these things in, you know, in our nails or hair or whatever the case you know, may be. Um, there are also something called Bose lines, and this may even be, I probably should have put in some pictures just to show you. This is if there's a depression, oftentimes transverse depression at the base of the nail, where literally you can kind of see that the nail bed kind of dips down. Um, and that oftentimes is that there was some sort of interruption to the growth of that nail, some sort of stressor that created that interruption. And that could be something in the, my line of work. I oftentimes see chemotherapy do that. Certainly malnutrition could do that. Traumas, um, if one does have really poorly controlled uh, blood sugar and diabetes and or liver issues, um, all would definitely be possibilities of why we would maybe um, see these kind of bows lines with this little depression all the way across the nail bed. And oftentimes when that's the case, it won't be on one nail, you'll see it repeatedly all the way across many of the fingers, if not all of your fingers. Um, and then the last one that I mentioned here is if the lunula, which is the little crescent moon that's at the base of your nail, typically it's a little bit, you know, of a lighter color. If that turns blue, then that could indicate that there could be a copper toxicity or an excess copper uh, level, which is oftentimes associated with a disease called Wilson's disease. I don't necessarily think that that's a strong association with the FOP community, but I thought I would just incorporate that one in there as well. A question did come in to know, ask, is there a way to know if genetics um, or if the person is low on a particular you know, value? And I would say there that if we were, you know, if you've had issues that you're thinking, oh, I question my iron because I do have really soft nails or I'm losing my hair or I question zinc because I have white spots and I'm losing hair, whatever the case may be. Um, regardless of genetics, I would say you would want to assess those values. It could be also that there are genomic SNPs SNP is a single nucleotide polymorph polymorphism, but basically it's a little piece of your DNA material. Um, and so that is one that um, we can kind of keep in mind in terms of if you could possibly have a variant that would challenge one in terms of absorbing zinc, 
Um, there are also SNPs or little pieces of our DNA material related to B12, related to vitamin B6, related to vitamin A, related to vitamin C, related to how we methylate, related to estrogen metabolism, you know, and so forth. But just because there is a variant in a SNP doesn't necessarily mean that one is certainly low in iron or low in zinc, but certainly would put one at a greater risk of that. Uh, and definitely if I have genomic data, by all means, I do um, look at that data in, in, in addition to seeing where somebody's status of these different nutrients you know, may lie. Excellent question. Um, further on, in terms of the nutrition-focused physical assessment, we could also simply look at our skin um, and things that could maybe be associated with simply dehydration could be everything from poor skin turgor, and that's where if you pick up the skin on your hand, you know, does it quickly go back down or do you find that it just sits up there? If it sits up there, you know, drink some more water, get in more fluids, have IVs if they're having a real difficult time, but that would indicate definitely um, implicate more in terms of dehydration. If the skin is simply cool or pale or clammy, um, if we know that the amount of input in terms of fluids and foods and so forth is less than how much we're putting out, um, if we're seeing weight loss that simply could be you know, dehydration weight loss, if we don't have anything to drink and we lose all the water associated with our you know, carbohydrates even, that in itself will take off a couple pounds uh, in a typical um, you know, average you know, kind of adult weight um, for sure. We may also look at the eyes and are the eyes particularly sunken or dry? Um, that also could suggest a little more along the lines of dehydration. And then urine, ideally the urine will be clear. Um, you know, maybe have a little bit of a yellowish kind of tint, but very, very pale colored uh, yellow. If it's a dark, dark, you know, yellow, orangey, you know, brown color, then definitely that would indicate dehydration and or other kinds of kidney, you know, challenges. Um, and speaking of kidney, you may see in terms of very common metabolic panel blood work where BUN, blood urea nitrogen, and or creatinine um, are elevated. That would indicate dehydration, indicate, you know, not necessarily the kidneys are struggling, probably more so just that uh, dehydration up, but if it was particularly elevated, then yes, it could indicate that there could be some kidney um, challenges. Um, additionally, you can look at your sodium levels, and sodium is an interesting one because it could be that your sodium level is very low, and that's dehydration because you don't have enough, it's low because there's not enough intake, or it could be that you have high sodium levels because you're losing so much fluid. Like if somebody was vomiting or had diarrhea, they may present with high sodium, not because they're getting in a lot of sodium, but because they're simply losing um, so much with um, that you know, fluid loss. Um, additionally, dry you know, mucous membranes, if somebody's finding that their mouth is particularly dry, um, that's a common sign of dehydration you know, as well. Additionally, for skin, I oftentimes look like at the corners of one's mouth in terms of what the, you know, right where their lips are together. If there are cracks there, that can be deficiencies possibly in iron or a B vitamin known as riboflavin or B2. Um, it also could be B6, and it also could be niacin, which is oftentimes referred to as vitamin B3. So predominantly B vitamins and iron, if we're seeing kind of these repeated kind of cracks in the corners um, of one's mouth. And then I mentioned a little bit with the fatty acids and the dry, um, dry hair. Similarly, if one has really dry skin, that too could be a deficiency in the fatty acids, or it could be a sluggish thyroid, or if one is not absorbing fats appropriately. Maybe they're even consuming fat, but if it's exiting them uh, and it's not being properly absorbed. Um, if one had fat malabsorption, um, some of the common, you know, symptoms or, um, note, you know, things you would notice would be that stools would be lighter in color. Oftentimes they would be yellow or orange, indicating that fat is going all the way through and hence creating a lighter color. Um, oftentimes you'd see that there could be um, oil um, within the stool, or you may see little oil drops on the toilet, you know, in the water, in the toilet, in the basin. Um, sometimes I ask about stool smell. 
Not that stool smells great, but is it more of like just a typical stool smell or wow, it's particularly foul smelling. If it's really foul smelling, it could be an indication that we're not absorbing fat appropriately and hence it's creating this more foul smell. Um, and maybe even seeing, you know, undigested food particles on a very regular basis, not meaning the occasional corn, but on a regular basis, seeing every day that there's undigested food particles in the stool. Um, and I had a patient um, a few years back, she came to see me and it was really related to chemotherapy and just making sure everything was good and she was just finished with her treatment. But I shook her hand, this is pre-COVID, uh, and I just noticed her skin was really dry, but I thought, well, it could be this particular chemotherapy taxol. I know it's very dry, maybe that's why it was. But I sat there thinking, you know, for the hour that I was consulting with her, and the skin on her face was also particularly dry. And this was actually, I think, in October in San Francisco. Not a time that our air is known to be particularly dry or frigid. Uh, and I started asking her about her stools and long story short, I found out that she had full, she didn't know, but we learned that she had full on fat malabsorption. And it was all because I noticed how dry her skin was. And it just didn't add up that her skin would be that dry given what she was eating, given how she was you know, living her life. It didn't make sense. So I oftentimes ask a lot about stools because I can learn an incredible amount of insight of what's going on with somebody knowing more about their digestive habits and their bowel movements. So I know that body weight can be a challenge for many within the FOP community. And I just thought I would highlight a couple kind of one, differentiate between a common term known as sarcopenia and another known as cachexia. And sarcopenia is typically more likely a term that we associate it with aging, where one is losing muscle mass and function, but normally it's something that we tend to see, you know, as one is getting, um, a, you know, older, you know, over 70, 80, and kind of, you know, as we live our lives. Cachexia is where one is losing muscle, but also losing body fat. And this oftentimes can be, you know, having no appetite, having a lack of energy, and also seeing this in terms of blood work, in terms of anemia. Um, and commonly you may see too, you know, cachexia, where someone turns around and one of the first places that we lose weight won't necessarily be where, you know, like your stomach, um, but oftentimes it's the butt. So if you see a really flat butt, then oftentimes that's to me, it's like, uh-oh, what's going on? Is there cachexia occurring where now they're losing uh, muscle mass and fat, and fat? Both of these conditions are associated, unfortunately, with increased mortality, increased infections, falls, particularly in an older population, um, slower wound healing, poor clinical outcomes and prognosis, and just in general, a decreased quality of life. So of course we want to do what we can to maintain appropriate body weight if possible. Um, looking here too, if we think about well, what would cause sarcopenia or cachexia, one, of course if we're not getting in enough nutritive value in terms of not enough calories, and or if we're consuming adequate calories but we're not appropriately absorbing our nutrients, um, if we have excessive levels of inflammation. This could also be noted either with biomarkers like C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, homocysteine, things like that, or it may simply be that we know there's inflammation because there's a lot of skin rashes or there's acne or you know, other kinds of inflammatory types of conditions, digestive issues, if there's diarrhea, if there's a lot of digestive disruption. Um, Oxidative damage could certainly lead to, um, I see this a lot, of course, within the oncology population. Um, if we are low in any of our anabolic or kind of building hormones, such as testosterone or insulin-like growth factor, um, if we're dehydrated, and or if we have something known as insulin resistance in terms of how our body's managing our blood sugar and glycemic control. So what could we do if we knew one was struggling with cachexia or sarcopenia? One, and this is, 
you know, a variety of different options because it's going to vary in terms of what would make sense for each individual. Um, but there are possible appetite stimulants that could be um, considered. Um, obviously, we're primarily working with children, so you want to be very careful, I think, in terms of various pharmaceuticals. Um, we definitely see, I see a lot within the oncology population using CBD um, to help with appetite. Um, exercise um, actually helps to increase um, you know, that muscle mass. So if there's a way not running a marathon, but even just doing you know, whatever exercises, even if they're seated exercises or if it's a simple functional exercises of standing and sitting, standing and sitting, um, avoiding smoking, hopefully a little less of an issue for this community. Um, making sure we're getting an ample amount of protein and amino acids, which are the building blocks for our protein. Uh, I would think that oftentimes you're probably looking at getting 1.5 to 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. So if you figured out that somebody was 50 kilos, then you would multiply that by 1.5 up to 1.8 to determine how many grams of protein would be the goal for that for one day and then divide it into however many meals or snacks one will be you know consuming. Um, there's some research to suggest that whey protein um, could be very beneficial in this um, case. It's a rich source of a variety of different types of amino acids including what we call the branch chain amino acids and they've been shown to be beneficial for building up body cell mass and muscle mass. Bodybuilders oftentimes use branch chain amino acids and whey protein. Um, here, if I were doing that, I would say just kind of, you know, like the scoop a day, uh, which would be about 20 grams of protein on a daily basis. Um, I was looking through all the research I could possibly find that wasn't absolutely just in terms of um, oncology and other areas, but what about within children in the pediatric population? And there was this trial showing that whey protein um, did help in terms of improving recovery rates in those that had moderate acute malnutrition. Um, so that could be something that could, I think, easily be incorporated into um, one's nutrition plan pretty easily and not overly expensive. Um, these areas, I couldn't really find much in, reg in regards to children and pediatrics, but I thought I would go ahead and incorporate them just in terms of knowledge base and you kind of determine if it's something appropriate or not. But creatine um, is one that may be useful in treating muscle wasting. Um, creatine is something we typically use a lot for like short endurance kinds of events. Um, we typically are producing, you know, hopefully a couple grams of creatine every day. Um, and this comes from um, the basis of the amino acids, glycine, arginine, and methionine. This would be um, typically in powder form, possibly capsules, but probably powder form um, if we were using that. Um, there's also something called carnitine. It's an amino acid related um, to, in terms of muscle. Um, so you're going to see this oftentimes in animal um, protein. Both of these, creatine and carnitine, you would find naturally in animal protein. The supplements are just going to give you greater amounts of them. Um, but carnitine is oftentimes low in those with cachexia, particularly at least with cancer-related cachexia. Um, and I have seen carnitine be beneficial for helping with fatigue um, and helping to build up lean body mass. Um, again, looking for pediatric research, uh, I definitely looked for FOP. There wasn't really anything that was stated for that particular population, but just if we broadened what we do see for, you know, then I thought it could possibly be uh, something we could consider. Um, and there's also a product, and I have no, asso no association with this product, it's known as Juven. And Juven is a combination of three compounds, arginine, glutamine, and HMB, hydroxymethylbutyrate. And that combination has been shown to be very beneficial for wound healing and supporting tissue building, but also to help increase and or maintain lean body mass. Um, and they've looked at this definitely with cancer. They've looked at it with the HIV population. They've looked at this a lot with post-surgery scenarios. Um, and I do think this would be something, again, you discuss with a practitioner and with the medical team. But if we were really struggling and we tried all the other things, you know, maybe that would be something that we could also possibly consider for one in the FOP community. Now, one of the challenges that we find with getting in enough nutrients is that if food doesn't taste good, then adults nor children are gonna have much interest in eating it. 
So one of the acronyms that I think is really key, and this was coined, I believe, by Rebecca Katz, who's a Bay Area chef. She's fantastic. She has some great cookbooks if you're ever interested in looking at beautifully illustrated cookbooks. But FAS, F-A-S-S, essentially is fat, acid, salt, and sweet. And essentially what you are thinking of is if we're looking at or tasting, for example, a bowl of soup, and it's, you taste it, and it's like, ah, eh, doesn't really kind of taste flat. Is there a little bit of fat or oil in there? Maybe we add a dash of olive oil. Maybe we put a little avocado. Maybe we put a little coconut. Maybe we put a little bit of almond butter or peanut butter in it or some other kind of nut or something like that in there. Um, is there a little bit of acid present? If we put a dash of, you know, you know, squeeze a little lemon in there or a little bit of vinegar, would that help to have the flavor of that food be that much more enhanced where then it's like, oh yeah, this tastes good. And then of course it's gonna be much easier to consume an appropriate amount. Um, salt, not meaning that we're gonna dump the entire salt container on there, but is there a little bit of salt that may actually help in terms of the flavor and the palate? Um, and even possibly a little bit of sweet. We'll talk a little about in terms of sugars. I'm not a fan of having lots of added sugars at all, um, but we may find that if even we add a little bit of applesauce to something, or we add even a teaspoon of maple syrup to, you know, eight cups of a, of a soup, then having a tiny bit, if that helps to really enhance the flavor, by all means, I think it could be, you know, well worth it. So keep in mind, if something doesn't taste well, or a child's complaining that this doesn't taste very good, then um, that's one thing is, what about F-A-S-S, FAS? If they're saying that things just taste bland or blunted, just kind of blah, cardboard, then I think we want to really focus on the fat, acid, salt, sweet. If on the other hand they say, no, it tastes metallic, it tastes like I'm eating metal, then I would say let's take a look at zinc because zinc deficiency very frequently presents itself also as things tasting very metallic. So we could assess zinc, of course we could you know, implement zinc supplementation, get zinc more within one's diet if that was needed. Zinc is gonna be found in protein foods. Um, the richest source by far, not so sure that they're high on many children's lists, but they are oysters. Uh, beyond oysters, all different types of proteins are gonna provide you zinc, whether that's fish, chicken, turkey, tofu, lentils, black beans, they're gonna all provide you, you know, some zinc. And then the other area that I think is important is making sure that somebody is adequately hydrated because if we are dehydrated, definitely food will not taste that great. So we want to make sure that there's also adequate hydration here too. Now, how do we go about helping then to reverse undernutrition, which I understand is definitely a challenge for many or can be for some in this community. So one, I would say we want to capitalize on when the appetite is the strongest. In the American diet, we tend to sometimes have lighter breakfast and lunch, and then we sit down and have a large dinner. If you find that appetite is the poorest at dinner, then I would say we want to really capitalize on an earlier time in the day. Um, I oftentimes find appetite actually is stronger when patients are more alert earlier in the day. So it may be that instead we focus on a larger breakfast and we allow a smoothie, a bowl of soup that we put in some protein, you know, something like that, that could be maybe a little bit smaller, but still providing some nourishment. One of the fastest ways to have somebody have no interest in food, if they have a little bit of nausea or they're just not really feeling very hungry, is to present them a really large amount of food. Then they're like, no, my, never mind, I'm not hungry at all. So instead, present small portions, something that would be doable, but again, also make sure we're targeting of when that appetite is the strongest. Definitely want to focus on getting in the protein foods, um, and that can be challenging sometimes if there's any kind of loss of appetite or desire for fish and chicken and you know, um, turkey and things like that may be a lot lower. Eggs sometimes can still sneak in there. And if those of if you have children who like tofu, that oftentimes does work well. And if we really need it, um, we certainly could possibly consider the whey protein or other types of proteins to help uh, supplement, you know, the diet or possibly, you know, some of the prepared beverages, things like that to help give a little bit of extra nutrition and extra, you know, calories, protein. Um, of course, we want to make sure we have healthy foods available as much as possible. Um, so thinking if we know there are going to be long days of appointments, can we put things in our purses? Can we bring things with us? Um, you know, can we have some things that's, you know, are going to be okay from a, 
um, sitting in the car even, um, in terms of things that would be non-perishable, that could be a good idea. And then do what we can also to be um, physically active to help build that muscle mass and also increase appetite. And if there's, you know, it could simply be, you know, can somebody walk around their kitchen table? Can they sit down and stand up? Can they sit down and stand up? It doesn't have to be that they're at the gym for 90 minutes or that they're running, you know, sprints or they're running a you know, half marathon, just whatever kind of activity, stretches, seated stretches, doing different resistance exercises, all of those could be great to help build muscle mass, but also to help increase appetite, which would then make it easier to reverse undernutrition. One of the challenges we run into oftentimes is fatigue. Um, and so here I would say, if we're finding fatigue, if we think it's at all related to nutrition, making sure we have those protein foods, plenty of fluids, because if we're dehydrated, we're gonna be fatigued. Um, think about also foods that require less energy to consume. So if, I, if you're exhausted and we present you a bowl of beautifully, you know, colored orange carrots, but if you're exhausted, it's going to require a lot of chewing for you to eat those carrots. If instead we gave you a soup that was a carrot ginger soup that was pureed that you could simply kind of drink even with your eyes closed, not have to even really chew, assuming you like carrots, you're likely much more um, you know, going to be able to consume that soup. So think about things that don't require lots of chewing. A big salad, fantastic, but if you're exhausted, probably not going to be the easiest to consume. Um, also, I put in there in terms of if there's any challenge in terms of swallowing, then we want to focus more on softer foods, soups, smoothies, possibly um, prepared beverages, avocados, mashed sweet potatoes, things like that, that again would be pretty easy to consume and not require a lot of energy uh, to consume. For nausea, a couple things to keep in mind. One, if we're dehydrated, then nausea is more likely to be a factor. So again, making sure that we're adequately hydrated. If we have nothing in our stomach, sometimes we see that nausea is worse. So sometimes having just a little bit of a bite can be helpful. So sometimes I'll say smaller meals, maybe more frequently than having just three, you know, larger meals. Um, and sometimes I find if there's really bad nausea, simply even just having a couple bites of soup or a few sips of a smoothie and then waiting you know, 20 minutes or so, allowing that to kind of settle. So then they're like, okay, now I feel a little bit better. Then one may be willing and okay to be able to eat more of a standard size of a meal. But if they're feeling nauseous, they're not gonna probably be able to do that. Um, additionally, and again, this is typically gonna be patient driven, but very commonly foods that are very high in fat, or if they're very spicy or they're very, you know, greasy um, and also very sweet, that may be more likely to trigger nausea. Um, I oftentimes see that sweet things, particularly for my patients undergoing chemotherapy, um, note that that actually triggers more nausea. So think about that even in terms of, you know, certainly cookies and drinks and things like that, but even um, Something that may be like an Ensure drink, just so sweet that it ends up having somebody like, no, I can't drink it at all. Um, or some of the different, you know, pediatric based products. Because oftentimes if it's designed for kids, the thought is it has to be so sweet. But be cautious of that, not only for the nutrient property issues and the concern of having too much sugar, but also because it actually may uh, go, you know, kind of sabotage your efforts uh, in terms of that nausea. Um, and another area that it has the most research that could be helpful is possibly ginger. Um, not necessarily gingerbread cookies. I was just trying to have some sort of little, um, you know, emblem there that would kind of signify ginger, but um, fresh, you know, ginger, ginger tea, ginger lozenges, um, fresh grated ginger just in some warm water, putting ginger in soups, putting ginger in oatmeal. Depends, of course, on if one would be willing to do that. They like the flavor of that, but ginger is known to be very beneficial for nausea. Um, I was also asked, what about those who have challenges and need to be on tube feeding or enteral feeding if they're not able to get in enough nutrition orally? Um, and or so we're getting that nutrition in via the gastrointestinal tract, whether we do that through a nasogastric tube, so the tube's going up through the nose and into the stomach, a G-tube, which goes directly into the stomach, 
or a J tube, which goes directly into the jejunum, which is part of the small intestine. That would depend on what we want to use all the different, if we can use our stomach, we want to use our stomach. Because if we don't use it, it will atrophy. Um, but if there was for some reason a different, or if there was like a bowel obstruction that we needed to go a little bit beyond that, then we may look at, you know, something further down like a J-tube. NG tubes, are, of course, are very aggravating. No one, particularly children, are not going to want to have something up their nose. That would just be a temporary thing if it was necessary. But the idea of tube feeding is to allow for adequate nutrition, yet still have the GI tract working. Because as I said, if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. And we don't want to have our gut atrophying. We don't want to have our intestinal function, our peristaltic movements, you know, just atrophying away. There are different types of tube feeding. Um, there's polymeric where the proteins are intact, um, kind of like the foods that we're eating. There's semi-elemental where we've started to break down some of those uh, intact proteins to make them a little bit easier to digest. There's fully elemental if there's a real difficult challenge being able to absorb uh, your intact proteins. And there's also some specialized formulas that could be designed if there's a particular renal focus or a particular, you know, um, you know diabetic focus, something like that. Um, I noted here a few brands of tube feedings that I would say have a much more nutritive quality to them. Um, one is Kate Farms. They make uh, actually vegan formulas. You, they have oral formulas. They also have tube feeding formulas. Um, you can even drink orally their tube feeding formulas. I think that they're a little bit sweet, but they are palatable. Um, there's also one called Liquid Hope, and there's also one called Real Food Blends. These are going to be much healthier combinations of nutrients and foods to create for, you know, tube feeding. And there are ways to get these all covered through insurance um, if one is really looking at needing to use um, tube feeding. Um, I was also asked to just mention some things in terms of bone health, and I want to make sure we have enough time for some questions, but I just put together uh, a couple charts just to kind of show you, and somebody had said, what about calcium? And calcium is definitely very important, but when I think about bone health, calcium is just simply one of the factors. I also want to know about vitamin D and magnesium and boron and phosphorus um, and as you'll see here um, you know potassium and vitamin K and our zinc level. So there's a lot of nutrients that are bone building. Um, so if we have bone related issues do we definitely have to have calcium? Perhaps but perhaps not. So in a perfect world I really like to be able to assess these different nutrients and you know know where the nutrients are and if one is depleted in anything well then yes we may work to boost those values up but if somebody has ample amounts of calcium and intracellularly um, in their system I don't necessarily think they have to have more calcium but these charts show you what would be the dietary sources that of where you would find these different nutrients what's typically kind of the recommended amount I put this in kind of for children, not infants, so this is definitely kind of, um, you know, four years and up, but not adolescents. I kind of did four to 11-ish just because I was trying to use different, um, you know, kind of provide ranges that would be appropriate. If we get into, you know, 14-year-old boy, that you know, numbers are really going to kind of increase. And obviously, if somebody is a three-month-old little baby, their needs are going to be less um, than a child who, you know, weighs 60 pounds. So these are different nutrients we can think about uh, in terms of bone health. Now, you can look at vitamin D, you can look at zinc in your main blood work, you could also look at magnesium in terms of red blood cells. Um, sometimes if we're wanting to look at all different nutrients intracellular, I use a company called SpectraCell and I run a micronutrient test panel. Um, and that could be a little more challenging depending on you know, what you have access to, although I'm happy to work with anyone who wants to you know, possibly look at that. It can be done nationwide, is not necessarily here, only in the Bay Area. In fact, the SpectraCell lab itself is in Houston. I have no connection with them. I just utilize their particular micronutrient. I think it's um, the best that's out there, at least now. And then also, I was also asked about kidney stones. This could be an entire hour discussion on its own, but I thought I would just put in one slide kind of bottom line. 
Uh, and so how do we go about managing kidney stones, preventing kidney stones? One is there is the potential of using a low oxalate diet. Oftentimes kidney stones are oxalic acid stones. So we oftentimes lower the amount of oxalates in the diet, um, things like spinach and rhubarb and so forth, to then have lesser amounts to build up these oxalic acid stones. We definitely wanna make sure we're getting ample amount of fluids. We wanna make sure there's adequate dietary calcium and also that we don't um, have excessive amount of salt. If we have a lot of sodium, it will actually work to deplete that calcium, which then upsets the balance, which may allow for a kidney stone. Um, and additionally, if we have a lot of vitamin C, meaning over 500 milligrams of vitamin C, that may um, you know, be likely to form kidney stones and be a concern. Now, the average individual who has no issues with kidney stones, I have no problem with somebody taking a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, two thousand milligrams of vitamin C. It's if the kidney stones are a potential, you know, concern. Um, for the average person, it's not so much, but for those, we definitely want to make sure we're not getting in too much in the way of supplemental vitamin C. Dietary vitamin C, generally not going to be an issue, but more so supplemental sources. Um, I would also say that I would really consider, is there any kind of a yeast or fungal overgrowth? Because I find that when there's candida or other kinds of yeast or fungal issues, then we see much higher oxalate levels in the system. And you can look at oxalates um, you know, through urine, the urine organic acids. Um, I oftentimes run those types of panels as well. And that can help us to determine if that's the case, I'd say, well, let's work to treat the yeast or fungal issue and not necessarily have to go through the hoops of following such a low oxalate diet and then also then that will hopefully help to you know just kind of resolve the kidney stone issue in the first place um, and then lastly there is a probiotic it's um, it used to be known as vsl number three now it's known as this biome um, and that particular probiotic has been shown to help with those who have kidney stones. Um, it's a very potent probiotic, um, but that's one that, again, if there really was a concern, there was recurrent kidney stone issues, you have kidney stones, you're trying to not have to pass them or have um, surgery or anything, then this bio may be a probiotic to possibly you know, consider. I'm just gonna get through this. I see there's a raised hand and then I'll, I promise I'll come right back. Um, I just thought I would, I almost didn't put this slide in there, but I thought, well, it's important to have a really healthy gut. Our gut is the cornerstone of immune system. So I just put in some kind of bottom line things that are signify what types of foods would be helping to heal up our gut. So lots of antioxidant rich foods, various types of vegetables and fruits. Uh, bone broth is actually very healing to the gut. Um, fermented foods like fermented vegetables, sauerkraut, kombucha, um, things like that, apple cider vinegar, those all can be great um, to help improve gut function. Um, there are a couple caveats if there is candida, if there is um, you know, any kind of a um, you know, yeast type of thing that could maybe exacerbate the case, but generally speaking, fermented foods would be great. Um, Coconut-based products typically are very healing for the gut. Um, having sprouted seeds, so they're easier to digest than even your standard kinds of um, seeds. Um, wild caught fish like salmon um, could be an excellent option. Um, organ meats, probably not on the top of the list for most children um, or necessarily even most adults. I'm definitely in that boat, not necessarily something that I look uh, to consume, but if you like them, they can be a very healthful, very rich in a variety of different nutrients. I would say most definitely opt for organic because if we're using things that are organs, it's probably like our liver, for example, is our major metabolic organ. So very important, I think, to purchase organic there. Um, vegetable juices could be an excellent way of helping to heal up gut function, uh, lessen inflammation, balance blood sugar, um, great things to do, particularly lots of different kinds of green juices and so forth. Um, antibacterial foods like garlic, um, all of these different things could be excellent for helping to heal up our gut. And then just kind of cir circling back, coming back hopefully for a circle. I know we have a couple questions as well, but again, why are we doing all this? Because I really do believe that 
if one is focusing on having improved nutrition, it will result in better energy, a desire for those more nourishing foods, better lab values, more stable glucose control, which is not only just in terms of the health, but even in terms of behavior can make a significant impact. Uh, you know, increase in muscle math and strength and flexibility, um, having a robust metabolism, a strong immune system, and again, an improved overall health, quality of life, and a sense of well-being. Here, if uh, I'm gonna again jump into Q&A, but um, just so you know, uh, I do have um, an ebook on my website about the microbiome. If you wanna take a look at that, if you wanna look at um, newsletters in terms of topics of probiotics or different recipes, things like that, certainly um, you can take a look at the blog. Um, if you wanna be on the newsletter, I send out a newsletter twice a month, typically with just uh, you know, one topic or so, or maybe some recipes with some sort of a theme, um, just to help provide good information. Uh, and you're welcome you know, email me on the website or sign up, and I'm happy to put you on the list for um, to receive those types of newsletters. Um, you can see that my website is natalieledesma.com. And with that, I know there was one hand raised, and then I'm just going to get to one other question that I know I saw come up. If you get your blood done and everything is a normal range, is that good? Is that good enough, or are there levels of X that blood can't measure, or will we need to say we want X tests for a full rundown to make sure our body is running normally and in healthy ranges? So I would say that sometimes ranges are great, and sometimes ranges I'm pickier than those ranges. So I would want to know what the numbers really are. Um, you know, hypothetically, for example, ferritin as a measure of your iron stores and normal ranges depending on the lab it may say that the normal range is from 10 to 232 that is a ridiculous range i would say that healthy optimal would be between 40 and 80. so if you're within that range i would say that yeah iron is not your issue and not something you need to worry about if it was at 20 technically normal in some ranges, sometimes it would still be flagged as low. I would say that it's still definitely low. It's definitely could be contributing to some of those challenges. So there you just need to somebody who, you know, looking at the range, but also looking beyond those ranges, is it an appropriate range, which hopefully it is, but I've definitely found that I have a finer, um, you know, kind of like, I kind of take a reference range oftentimes and make it much smaller in terms of really where I like to see various types of lab values. Uh, and like I said, um, the spectra cell one in terms of really looking at everything, that's a test that looks at all of your B vitamins, uh, amino acids, metabolites, light carnitine, uh, glutamine levels, glutamine's key in terms of gut healing as well, looks at all bone building nutrients like D3, K2, magnesium, calcium, zinc, vitamin A, um, it also looks at some uh, very key antioxidants in addition to vitamin C and E and selenium. It looks at glutathione, how well you're clearing toxins from your liver, coenzyme Q10, alpha-lipoic acid, um, and that's definitely something that I will sometimes use. It's measuring the previous four to six months, so I like it that it's not a snapshot of how things were just last week. It's really kind of giving you an overview, um, and from a nutritive perspective, I oftentimes do look at that if we can, I mean, sometimes if we're just looking at a couple, um, we, you know, we can look at some through mainstream, you know, work that can go through your practitioner, that can go through your insurance exclusively, um, and that could definitely be one that would work, you know, as well. So I didn't mean to close that. I was just trying to find the Q and A here. We had two other questions, Natalie, that were submitted ahead of time. The first is um, an adult who I have acid reflux, what are some good foods to help keep the acid down? And they already take Tecta and try to follow a diet low in acid. So do you have other suggestions for foods that could help with that? Yeah, so for acid reflux, uh, again, we could spend a whole hour on that, but a real quick you know, synopsis too. Typically what's gonna trigger acid reflux, fatty foods, acidic foods, caffeine, coffee, tea, chocolate, um, mint, mint tea, mints, chewing gum that has mint flavor, mint toothpaste, alcohol, probably in terms of, F, you know, 
children, probably not so much the issue, but all of those things are known as the most common triggers. Um, now, one of the things that I like to do if there's really acid reflux is, is it because there's too much acid or is it actually because there's not enough acid? Oftentimes I find if we actually add a little bit of acid, then the symptoms actually can improve. Um, for a time perspective, I'm gonna actually say there is a webinar that I have on my website that's free. The, and I believe in that webinar, I do talk about one, the baking soda test um, and some other things that we could do for um, acid reflux. Um, but also I would say there's something called DGL, deglycinerized licorice, that is used sometimes just for symptomatic relief. It's not necessarily going to be curing this long term, but it definitely can be useful to take these little DGL capsules or chewable wafers 20 minutes or so prior to meals, and particularly if you know where it's problematic. Um, and then I oftentimes really think key for acid reflux long term is something called zinc carnosine. Zinc carnosine is absolutely essential for the upper gastrointestinal tract. Um, and I use 75 milligrams a day, probably at least for four to six weeks to may go a little bit longer, but it's not something that's designed to be done forever. Um, and that's another option. I typically have used um, Pure Encapsulations has one called Peptic K. I've also used Integrative Therapeutics has one called Heartburn Advantage. Um, I've used Designs for Health has one called GastroMend. Um, there are definitely a few different brands you know, out there. Uh, and again, if somebody's really interested and you wanted to get access to some of those uh, companies, I can definitely get you, you know, 20% discounts and just give you a link to kind of be able to set up an account to get some of those at a discount that are oftentimes not sold through uh, retail establishments um, and sometimes not even sold through Amazon, but also the prices will be Amazon too. So certainly options if we're looking at those. And the last question was, uh, what are some things that people with FOP should be doing so that they do not feel so full while still eating enough calories? So there I would think, you know, a lot of it probably would come down to, I think in terms of psychologically, one thing is don't put a lot on a plate. If you put a lot on a plate, it just kind of like psychologically has a shutdown. So that's where if you can do small things kind of, you know, spaced regularly. Um, but also I think liquid things like soups and smoothies, if somebody can drink something, um, sometimes they kind of forget that they're having 500 calories because they're drinking it, particularly if there's a straw, metal straw, bamboo straw, things like that, where they can just kind of drink it easily. Um, then sometimes the thought is that we're not so full. Um, and definitely want to make sure we're focusing, as much as I typically want to really focus on vegetables, um, if we're having a hard time being able to get in enough calories, if I give you a big salad, I may fill you up and then we're not going to get the protein. So I want to make sure we're getting protein and then maybe we kind of put in, you know, but I really do think, you know, smoothies and soups and things like that can be, can work well. And it may be that we need to kind of add protein to those things. So if you made a smoothie, hypothetically, you know, maybe some fruit, uh, and they'd say, somebody doesn't feel that well or they're not wanting to eat a lot, don't put everything under the kitchen sink in there because they'll probably take a sip of it and then not want it. Keep it simple. So I would say a little bit of fruit, some sort of liquid. Um, if they're digestive issues, I really would go non-dairy. Um, so possibly coconut milk, almond milk, you know, oat milk, hemp milk, whatever it is that you're, you know, that works for that individual. Um, and then put, put maybe some sort of protein in there. Um, so something, the one that I think is the kind of the most masked and you don't taste it would be something called collagen peptides. Um, Vital Proteins has a great product like that. Um, that one you can add to hot or cold foods um, and hot or cold beverages. Um, that's the only one that you can add to hot foods or hot beverages. Um, so if you know somebody had hot tea or if they had a cup of, you know, bowl of oatmeal, um, but maybe kind of like hiding a little bit of protein in these different foods, have a little applesauce, but put a little bit of protein, you know, in it. Not tons, because that's going to change the texture, but just add a little bit to kind of, you know, throughout by the end of the day that you've been able to have, you know, more of those calories, you know, consumed. And then I think the whey protein, unsweetened whey protein powder could be another, you know, possible option that could be useful, um, you know, as well. Um, and then if you were looking in terms of meal replacement drinks, um, of course, the, I'd say certainly a homemade smoothie 
would be the healthiest because it's going to, you can add in all sorts of, you know, new things and there's no sugars or added sugars. There's nothing kind of, you know, chemicals and things like that in there. But when we need to have prepared meal replacement drinks, because time we're exhausted, they're in the car, whatever the case may be, oftentimes they can be very useful. I would say that um, the healthiest options, in my opinion, are uh, Kate Farms, uh, and they have a few different ones um, that are available. They have ones that are a little bit higher in calorie, ones that are more standard, and they have ones that are really high that I said that you could use for tube feeding even. Um, their products, I think, um, are pretty good and can't even work to get like a sample. So if there's something like you want to just try a sample before you're ordering a case, um, if you're able to do it through the website, go for it. If you're not, let me know and I can help um, expedite that. Um, I also like Enu, E-N-U is another company that I think um, has, you know, decent uh, nutritive uh, breakdown, you know, there. And then Orgain, definitely much more common. Um, they have a lot of different types of products. They have plant, pea, you know, pea protein, plant-based products. They have some that are grass milk products. They have some that are, you know, different ones. So depending on kind of what the focus was, but their products typically don't include high fructose corn syrup. Um, and I would say from a digestive perspective, casein, milk casein, milk protein concentrate, those are more difficult to handle, and they're likely going to make one feel very full, um, if not we give more digestive disruption. So those I'd be much, much more cautious of try to avoid things that have milk protein concentrate or milk caseinate or calcium caseinate as the main protein source. So... Um, you're welcome <laughs> on one of the on one of the things. Um, any other questions, clarifications that we didn't get to yet?